Good morning. Glad you all are here. This morning's lesson is entitled Personifying Righteousness. The text comes from John chapter 14, the first 11 verses. Jesus said, let, your heart be, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Personifying righteousness. Now the word personify or personify. Um, I looked it up, just went online to a, a dictionary and, and uh, you know, block copied and pasted these definitions out. But if you drop down about the fourth or fifth line down, the last definition in that first point, it says to represent or embody a quality or concept, etc. In a physical form, he fairly personifies trustworthiness. Now, you know, trustworthiness is not something you can get and lay up here on the, on the corner of the pulpit like I can this Bible. Um, I can tell you all about it and how it's supposed to be. But you see it when I behave in a trustworthy way. When anybody behaves in a trustworthy way, you know it. You see it. You see, yeah, okay, that's it. He's doing it. And that person may be so trustworthy that you say, boy, that's trustworthiness personified right there. It's just an illustration. So by watching Jesus, the apostles could, could see God. By watching us, people should see Jesus. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Chapter 3 and 2. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then in verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Boy, this is starting to get scary now. Chapter 3 and 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And that's in chapter 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So when you put all those verses together and think about them, the bottom line is, is we can't now, we'll, we will never be sinless. That's just not possible because we're human beings. If he say, and he say he has no sin, the truth is not in him. 1 John 1, verse 8 and 9. So what is he telling us here? That he's telling us here is that we can reach a level of righteousness that is absolutely distinct from the behavior of the rest of the world. Matter of fact, the Bulletin article this morning discusses that to some extent too. The idea of separateness. What should people see in us what should people see as they watch us from day to day? Again, as we are walking in the light as he is in the light, as we are behaving as he behaved, what sort of thing ought people to be able to see and then identify? Now, they may not know what they're looking at. I won't argue that with you. It may be so foreign to them that they don't have a clue. 
They just know that you're, you're absolutely the oddest person I've ever seen. Okay, they just don't, well, they don't know what they're talking about, actually. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Paul says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And note the contrast between being filled with wine, wherein is excess, or with the Spirit, in which control exists. So by being filled with the Spirit, reading and studying the Word of God, and knowing what it says and what it means and how it applies, by the way, that's a, that's a sign of spiritual maturity as you go through your Bible, as you go through your Christian life and you read and study the Bible on a regular basis, think about what you've read and studied and make application to yourself. You'll get better at it and people will see the difference. It's like, it's like you know, we're talking about being a nurse with Deanie. You know, when she was in the hospital a while back and, and for her knees and everything, and the nurses had a discussion down at the nurse's station, are you a nurse? Well, how do you know? Well, how do you know who a nurse is? She had everything arranged just exactly so. <laughs> so people know what they're doing, recognize that kind of stuff. All right? You know, they listen to you talk. They, they watch a, one fisherman watches another fisherman bait his hook or get a, a lure out of the tackle box and thread it up. You know what you're doing. Boy, I've never seen a knot tied like that. Show me how to do it. They recognize expertise when they see it. They, they're from, they know the behavior of that particular uh, uh, class or group of people that do that particular kind of work. Same thing here. When we behave as Christ behaved, when we take upon ourselves the same mindset as Jesus did, people will see a difference in us. They, they have to see a difference in us because there, there is a difference in and being a Christian and, and being a not Christian. They will recognize that we are being influenced. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Somebody might say, where are you getting that stuff you talk about? all? Where do you get that? That's, I've never heard that. But where are you getting that? I'm reading and studying the Bible. Oh, you're one of those people, aren't you? Yeah. I guess I am. Thank you very much for noticing. <laughs> when you turn it back off, they don't know what to do. Our, well, again, that's a walking in the light, 1 John 1, 7. We are, we are guided and motivated and directed by the Word of God so that we behave in a very, very specific manner. We talk. We don't say things. And we say other things. And we'll kind of cover that here in just a little bit as we go along. But our lives will be such that the Father is glorified. Let your, work so, uh, let your work so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Again, where are you getting all that? Well, I've been reading and studying my Bible. Well, that explains that. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, your style of living, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of judgment. In the day of visitation, rather, not the day of judgment. First Peter chapter 3, Likewise, ye wives, be a subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Having a good conscience, that, when, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Well, you know, somebody might be criticizing you for how you behave. Oh, we, we talked in this morning about... Uh, in Bible class this morning about uh, living such a life that uh, well, I, what I said was is if we just took the Bible as a rule book, forget, forget the religious aspect of it for just a moment, uh, the this, this spiritual aspect of it, and just looked at it as black letter law. Let him that stole steal no more. What if, what if everybody started doing that by midnight tonight? All over the world, that people that were stealing stopped stealing, made restitution, and got a job. So that they had, I know, Gary goes, well, 
So, so, that, so that they could have to give to others in need. If that started at midnight tonight, just think of the change in that alone would be tremendous. And that's what I'm talking about. If we just do what the Bible says. Now, there's obviously spiritual aspects to it. But there's a practical side, too. You know, let, if, if you had a filthy, if you were a sailor, talking like a sailor, all right, and, and suddenly you stopped. And you didn't tell any more of those jokes. It takes you a while to get over telling them, too. But when you stop telling those jokes, when you stop talking like that, when you stop drinking like a sailor, which is a distinct thing, too, people see that. They notice the difference. Well, you don't go drinking with us anymore, do you? No. Why? I became a Christian. Oh, you're better than us. I hope so. I mean, don't say that, but I mean, I hope so. Really. You should be better than everybody else. You've got a motivation that everybody else doesn't have. And you could just run that out, you know, all the way out just to a logical conclusion and, and, and so forth. But, but, but people are going to see your behavior and you're going to attribute it to becoming a Christian. And people are, now they may not like it. Well, you're just, you just think you're business and to give you a hard time. But listen, I'm, I'm not beating, about, beating you about the head and shoulders with the Bible. I didn't like that when I was, before I became a Christian. I, don't, I have to assume other people don't like it. But if I have a question about the Bible, and I know Charles back there is a faithful child of God, or at least purports to be, I might go to Charles, what about this? Well, I'm glad you asked. You want to know what your Bible has to say about it? Well, that's what I came to you for. I don't have a Bible anyways, so that's all right. We fix that too. Sit down, boy. And we, when we open up, we get an answer. Well, that's just crazy. I'd never heard about that before. I know it's a good thing you asked, didn't it? Okay? And then it just goes on from there. So what should people hear as they listen to us from day to day? I mean, they're watching us. What are they going to hear? Colossians 4 and verse 6. Paul says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Think about that. Think about the things that if we just did that, if everybody did that by midnight tonight, at 0001 tomorrow morning, one minute after midnight, everybody stopped talking filthy. And everybody's, and everybody's speech was graceful, it was seasoned with salt, you know, a sacrifice, going back to sacrifices. And, being, and knowing how to answer every man. Just think about that. It might, it might be real quiet for a while before people recovered from that. Just think of the things that wouldn't be said. Just think of the music that wouldn't be played. I know. Remember years ago, I guess it was uh, Tipper Gore, Al Gore's ex-wife. She was testifying before Congress about lyrics. This is back in the 80s, maybe. I don't remember now. And she had song lyrics, and she started reading them. Order, order. You can't say that here. <laughs> when, people, when people go to these school board meetings here just recently, and they get, a, they get a, 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 a book out of the high school library that is available for your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and that mother opens up that book and starts reading a passage to the school board, and the school board cuts her off because that's filthy language. And they, let, they bought that for your children and grandchildren. Well, isn't that lovely? But that, they don't want that read to them? Are you kidding me? That, now, I tell you what, shame on us for letting it happen. It'll stop when we decide it'll stop. We go down and tell them no. And if they won't listen, well, we're changing you out come next election season. Well, you shouldn't talk politics. Why? Politics is a public expression of your privately held religious beliefs. Tell me I'm wrong. Convince me I'm wrong, rather. You can tell me I'm wrong all day long. Speaking truth. Ephesians 4 and verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, but with tender hearts. Down to verse 32, and be ye kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay. Well, I told him the truth, didn't I? New mother comes up with that first baby. And that kid, whew, what do you think of my new baby? Boy, that's the ugliest kid I've ever seen. That's the truth. But you don't say that. How could you say that? 
Well, what, well, what do you say? Well, it's got to t- looks just like his daddy, doesn't he? <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, what do you say? You, it's the truth. I told them the truth. They need, I, had, I told you about the fella in the Navy. I'm going aft, and he's coming forward, and we come to a hatch, and those hatches are about that wide, and one person at a time goes through them. So Jim stepped back. Come on through, Hill. I got something I want to say to you. Yes, what's that, Jim? He grabbed me by the shirt, literally grabbed me by the shirt, Mike. And he pushed me up against the bulkhead and he said, you're going to hell if you don't repent. Well, I know that. I just don't need you telling me. That's rather rude. I mean, he was correct. He was absolutely 100% correct. If I died right there on the spot, I'd have gone to hell. No question. But that's not the way you say it. That's just not the way you say it. And I think we, I hope we all understand that. They should hear the gospel. Jesus said, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's our job is to teach. Now, granted, folks don't want to hear, but that's our job to teach. Our job is to try to teach people the truth. And that means we have to be the kind of people that folks are going to listen to. And we have to speak in such a way that people will want to hear what we have to say. Now, they, they may cut us short. No question about that. I go to Charles asking that question. He starts telling me, and I say, oh, wait a minute, Charles. I don't want to hear that shit, mate. Well, Gene, you asked. You came to me. If you want to continue, just give me a call. We'll we'll get back together again. And when it bothers me enough, I may go back to him and hear the rest of what he had to say. May not like it then either, but I asked. And and, uh, in um, Acts chapter 16, verse 30 through 34, the uh, Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, verse, uh, verse 30. He says, uh, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now there's a period there, but we shouldn't stop reading. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. In other words, they told him what to believe. Well, you need to believe. Well, now we're going to tell you what you need to hear. And he notice what he did. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Uh, washed their stripes. Now, why do you suppose he did that? Because he'd been told to repent. How do you know? He washed their stripes. They had been done wrong. And he was trying to make right what had been done wrong. Alright. And he was ba- and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. So they heard the truth. They believed the truth. They did the things they needed to, to do in regards to the truth. And, and which included trying to fix the wrong, right the wrong, make restitution, if you will, and then were baptized, he and his, all his, and rejoiced later that night, and then he sat down and had a common meal. So that's what people do when good hearts hear the gospel faithfully preached. That's what happens. But it's also a daily conversation about the Christ. It's a daily conversation. Over in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 through 12. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him. uh, Excuse me, that's chapter 9. Go back to chapter 8. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now we don't do miracles today, but we tell people what the Bible says about miracles. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city, but there was a certain man named, called Simon, which before time in the city, had used, in the same city, used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard... Because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But, in contrast, when they believed Philip preaching the things that concerned the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So they, people saw the difference. And they saw the difference between the false teacher and the real, the, the false performer and the real performer. 
But then there's that, just that regular living the life as we ought to live it. That's sometimes, you know, I don't like to use the word testimony, but that's sometimes the best testimony in the world is to live as you ought to live. And people see the contrast between what they knew you to be and what they see you to be now. And then they observe everybody else around you and there you are, behave, you're, like, you're like an oasis in the desert. There's a distinction there and there should be. So what should people expect from us? Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So here we are seeking the righteousness of the kingdom of God. What should people see? They should see a life lived consistent with biblical principles. Grace of God that bring us salvation hath appeared unto all mankind, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and God in this present world. And we're looking forward, Paul goes on and says, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I, I, always, I always put this in there when I talk about his coming or, or dying. I, I'm not afraid of it, but I'm nervous about it. I've never died. Don't know what it's like personally to experience it. When Christ comes again in flaming fire, it's going to be a rather spectacular event. If you've ever been near a big explosion or a roaring fire, and I don't mean just a little bitty fire, I mean a huge fire, and you've experienced some of the sights and sounds that it will at least touch on the greatness of all this universe and all the material universe exploding and going away. That's going to be tremendous. And I imagine even the faithful is going to be kind of startled by that thing when it happens. Just, just as a thing, my own thinking on that. But it is a life lived in view of the judgment day, but not in fear of judgment. Again, it's the attitude of respect and nervousness because it's going to be a great day and, and things are going to be brought out in Revelation 20 and verse 12. We're going to be judged by our works. That's, what we're, that's what's going to be looked at. What did you do and why did you do it? And that's what he says in, Re, in Revelation 20 12 and Matthew 7 21. Not everyone saith me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now you have two sets of works here. You have works of the flesh, how everybody lives, even good moral people, how they live. Really, the only thing, the only difference that they would make, that they would have when they obeyed the gospel is the fact that they had, had come out, they were no longer living outside of Christ, still the same good moral people, but now they've got a religious reason for doing it. You know, we, we all know people that are just absolutely good moral people. They don't smoke. They don't drink. They don't cuss. They don't run. They, they're good to their spouses. They treat their children lovely. They, they stop at every stop sign and, and all those things that make up a good citizen and that you would love to have as a neighbor. We know people like that, but they're lost. And the only difference that would be, that would be observable, the only change, I mean, if you're not smoking or drinking, you can't stop smoking or drinking. How could you do any less if you're not doing it in the first place? So the only real difference was they would be worshiping with us on a regular basis and becoming faithful Christians, mature faithful Christians. Because their mindset had changed. Their way of looking at life had changed. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God, which God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. So the works that we are to do in submission to God are not works of righteousness, but they are those things that we are duty bound to do. Uh, Luke 17 verse 10, if you want a verse for that. And first, uh, 1 John 2 and verse 3 he says, hereby we do know that we know him, that we keep his commandments. All works of righteousness. No, it's not works of righteousness. They are righteous works that God has ordained that we should walk therein. My question is, which righteous work that God has ordained we should walk in, can we leave off? And that we are not to do. Now, there might be some silly person that would raise their hand just, just to make a silly statement. But a rational person that is thinking, that is serious, would never ever say that, would never ever bring up a silly thing in context of that conversation. Because obviously they're going to see, I would hope they'd see the, the, the obvious nature of 
doing what God is set to do is not, quote, a work of righteousness that saves us. There's no work of righteousness that saves us or stack of them a mile high. It's doing those things that God has said to do. It's our duty to do. When he sees us doing those things, he's going to save us by his grace. He is the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Which person, which disobedient soul is God going to save? Let me put it that way. And I would want a book, chapter, and verse to support your point that's taken in context. They should see Jesus. The bottom line of all of this is when we behave as least... Now, this is not exhausted by any shake of the imagination. And I didn't intend it to be. There's no way it could be. But the fact is, when people see us living the way we're talking about, they're going to see Jesus of necessity. Now, again, they may not recognize it. Acts 10 and verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Galatians 6 and verse 10. And we have there, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them of the household of faith. Now, the obvious nature, the obvious thing here is that we are not able to go about doing the miraculous things that Jesus did. We don't have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's miraculous in nature, enabling us to do that kind of stuff. That ended a long time ago. The reason for it, the purpose for it, has, has been met and made, and we don't, we don't need them anymore. But the fact is, is people can still see us going about doing good. When we, when we send stuff over to the, our Ukrainian brethren to support them in their time of dire need. By the way, that's going to happen again, hopefully soon. Um, people see that. Matter of fact, I had a, had a text message this past week that somebody that knows my next door neighbor who knows we collected for the Ukraine is wanting to know. She said, this person said, I've got a lot of people that want to contribute. All righty then. So we're going to be doing that and collecting that stuff here soon, I guess. I'm not sure exactly when it's going to happen again, but when we get enough, the truck will come by. But people see that. People recognize the good work. And when they see us behaving as we ought to, they recognize that. Now, being a reflection of Jesus, the righteousness we live is not ours, but that of Jesus. In Philippians 3 and verse 9, Paul says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, works of righteousness, which are the, of the law, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So when I do by faith the things that God has said for me to do, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and I walk by faith, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, then I am doing the righteousness of God, and he by grace will save me. We are they who have overcome this world by faith. This is a crucial point. In Revelation 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they lived not their lives unto the, they loved not their lives unto the death. 1 John 5, 4 and 5, For, whoso, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh this world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? If you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God and all that that implies, then you're going to obey the gospel and live by it. Because the demons believe that Jesus is the Christ, but it doesn't do them any good. They tremble. But those of us that hear the truth, believe the truth, We'll start practicing the truth and we'll be directed by the faith of God that he talks about. We are they who, who come to Jesus. Jesus said, come unto me all you that labor. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13, 14, and 15. We are called by the gospel and have been saved by grace and not by works of righteousness. Titus 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. All those things that Jesus said to do to walk in. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. I don't believe you have to be baptized. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Then the, the non-believer is not going to obey the gospel. 
And everybody that says, oh, how I love Jesus, but they don't do what Jesus says, they don't believe in Jesus. They don't have faith in Jesus. Now, I'm not going to argue with what they're telling you. I'm going to tell you what they're not doing that illustrates what they really don't believe. 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth. They don't obey the truth. Through the spirit and unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, they haven't been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The person that believes the word of God, that overcomes the world by their faith, has obeyed the gospel and continues to obey the gospel. And continues to walk in the light as he is in the light. And continues to allow themselves to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. The non-believer won't. The non-believer is lost. And the non-believer, the one that refuses to obey the gospel, cannot reflect Jesus. I'm not arguing that they're, that they're, not, that they're not living a good moral life. I, 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 w- I affirm that they live a good moral life. I affirm they don't drink, cuss, smoke, do all the stuff that we look, we look on as being sinful activity. I, I, I affirm that they treat their spouses right and they treat their children lovingly and all those things that goes along with being a good person. I affirm that, but I also affirm they haven't obeyed the gospel and are lost. Colossians 1.13, they're having been translated from, the, from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That's obedience to the gospel of Christ. They are still under the power of darkness. But they're good moral people and they're lost. But they're pious and they're lost. Well, how do you know they're lost? They haven't obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine delivered to become a son of righteousness. That's how I know. How do you know? They have said, I don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, you're just being judgmental. Well, I'm, being, I'm passing judgment or recognizing judgment. John 7, verse 24, judge righteous judgment. It's not censorious. I'm not giving anybody a hard time. I'm just simply telling folks what the Bible says. I'm just reading the words and applying the words. Our encouragement for you is to become a child of God. You do so by obeying the gospel. Jesus has told us specifically what the gospel is. It's hearing the truth, John 6, 44 and 45. These are all quotes from Jesus. Believing that he is the Messiah, John 8, and verse 24. Repenting of our sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Confessing Jesus as Lord, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Being baptized for mission of sins, Mark 16, uh, Mark 16, 16, and then living the faithful Christian life, Revelation 2 and verse 10. That's just what Jesus said. But you decide what you're going to do. But if you don't do what Jesus said, you're not, you, there's no way you can overcome the world by faith. Because the only ones that overcome the world by faith are those that obey the gospel and live faithfully. That's how you overcome the world by faith. And it's not your faith, it's the faith that we have in Christ. Become a child of God. If you are a child of God, but you've been unfaithful, come back. Ask God's forgiveness and, he's, and, and repent of your sin. He's promised to forgive you. If you have Bible questions, let's sit down with an open Bible and study them. If you need prayer, that's what we're here for likewise. And we'll pray for you and go before God for, with your name and ask him to bless you in whatever way you're seeking. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come down front and let us know. All together we stand and sing the hymn of invitation.